Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we are grateful that we are here in your presence. And we're grateful for your word that we're about to hear. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our lives to what you're doing in your word and help us to apply it by the power of your spirit as we look to you, as we finish up this book, this epistle, we look to you and trust you and look to Christ, realizing that you are our joy and treasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and we are going to be starting in verse 10. If you can stand, we're gonna, I'm going to read, and you can follow along in your book, your Bible. I'll read starting in verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You have indeed, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of, placing, of uh, facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet, it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except for you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more, I am well supplied, and having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory and forever and ever. Amen. And greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with you greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word as you sit down. You know, discontentment may be the greatest trap in our treasure, in our culture, right? Discontentment may be the greatest trap in our culture. It may be greater than lust, greed, or even lying, because discontentment actually leads to all of these other sins. It, it, it tends to be a wellspring of iniquity. It feels like the entire world is in colluding to stir up discontentment within us. If you look around, if you watch TV, if you have your phones, you can't get away from it. Discontentment is all around us. And then you look at Paul's circumstances. It didn't look great for the Apostle Paul. He was in prison. He was chained to an elite Roman guard. He's waiting trial before Caesar with his life at, the very, uh, at stake there. To make matters worse, the local pastors in Rome and, and throughout different provinces have distanced themselves from Paul. And he is unable to pay his own bills at the time he's, he's in house arrest there. The Philippian church then sends Epaphroditus to bring a gift to help him. And he gets sick and almost dies on the pro in the process of coming to Paul. Whatever could go wrong seems to have gone wrong for the Apostle Paul. But he's not downcast. He's not in despair. In fact, he's even joyful as he sends this letter back, this vibrant letter that's full of life. He, he is not crushed by his circumstances. He has the secret of contentment. So how is it possible to be content when everything seems to be falling apart? We, we have to be aware that sin has infiltrated every aspect of our world. Our whole existence seems to be at the nature of discontentment. We see both spiritual and physical discontentment 
So where are our needs met? That's the question we have to ask ourselves as we look at the end of this book. Because Paul is, is, is hopeful in the midst of all the things that seem to be going wrong. He's hopeful for what, look, as he looks forward. So the, the gospel brings, the big idea we're going to be talking about today, the gospel brings thankfulness and fullness while embracing the family of saints in Christ. The gospel brings thankfulness and fullness while embracing the family of saints in Christ. So in, in chapter 1, we see the advance of the gospel. We talked about this last week. The advance of the gospel as we live in Christ together in community, side by side, as citizens of a new kingdom. Uh, in chapter 2, we see we are to adopt Christ's mindset in life and death, looking to his example of humility in the, in the resurrection. His return in his life is, is the... Uh, preeminent example, but also is his life paid for our sins and applied his righteousness to us because the gospel is bound to who Christ is. And then we're called to emulate. <laughs> we're called to emulate godly Christians around you in chapter 3. Godly Christians around you to live out a mindset of Christ, to look to those who live as Christ-like examples so now here in chapter 4, we're, Paul calls to stand firm in Christ, meaning to never give up living out the gospel. Depending on the grace that Christ provides, he is the victor and we stand in Christ alone. So, point one, the gospel brings thankfulness to every situation. The gospel brings thankfulness to every situation. How is that possible? Here, here we see Paul... And he says, I rejoice in the Lord. How many times has he get, gone back to joy? Joy is like a big theme here in Philippians. He keeps going back to joy and saying, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. See, Paul expresses his joy that's grounded and caused by the Lord himself, not his circumstances. He's saying that because of what Christ has done, he can be joyful. In fact, he says, uh, MacArthur writes, though... This situation was extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult. Paul was not discontent. It did not matter that he was a prisoner living in a small apartment, chained to a Roman soldier, subsisting on a sparse diet. None of that affected his contentment. So this is what we need to, we need to figure out what the secret Paul has here. Because I think our, many times we look around and we say, oh, I wish... I wish I had that, or I wish I could do that, or I wish I could go there. Our culture is built on discontentment. Our whole, our whole culture seems to thrive on this discontentment, always wanting more. But Paul didn't. His joy is bound to the Lord. With, he says, with the revival of concern. So there, there he is, he's saying, your, your concern has been revived. And this is the idea of like, you know, in the <clears throat> winter, everything goes dormant. Maybe not in Florida, but everything goes dormant here in the winter. <laughs> we lose leaves, we lose, you know, every, all the beauty around that we see right now, it's dormant. And this, this uh, word here, revived, actually is the Greek, in the Greek it means to bloom again, to bring back to life. And so he's saying, you have, your concern has come back to life. For me, your mindset, your thinking, and the concern actually is, is that word mindset, your, your, how you live, what your mind is set on. It's come back to life. You are feeling concerned for me. See, he avoids the silent treatment of actually rejoicing in the Lord. Uh, he, he avoids the silent treatment by rejoicing in the Lord in front of the Philippians. Thus, Paul ends the letter the way he opens it. He says, I give thanks for you in every remembrance of you in verse 3 of chapter 1. Do you thank God for those who care for you, who bless you in various ways? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. How are we being living in thanksgiving, in thankfulness? Uh, in fact, ch chapter 1, verse 7 uh, talks about that mindset. He says, it is right for you to feel uh, in that word phroneo, it's the mindset. It can be, mean feel or to think. And a lot of times we don't equate thinking and feeling together, but in the Greek it does. It says the way you think many times leads to the way you feel. 
And so if you change the way you think, you can change the way you feel at times. So he's saying, it is right for you to feel, for Neo, this way about me because I told you, uh, because I hold you in my heart. And then he goes in chapter 4, verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord, you know, that you provide your concern, your for Neo for me. So there he is, he's saying that there is a mindset, there is a concern, a mindset that is shared amongst them. And he uses this word several times throughout the, it, it's translated differently, but he uses it over and over and over again to say, our mindset is meant to be on Christ, mm -hmm. focused on Christ, bound to Christ, that if it is set on something else, then you won't be content. But if it's set on Christ, there's going to be revival happening in your life. It refers to something that grows in full bloom. It's been dormant, like I said. So Paul is overjoyed to see the blossoming of this mind of Christ once again in the flower garden of the Philippian church. He sees Christ's mindset over and over and over. See, there's no opportunity that they had there before to be able to help him. They didn't have the opportunity, so we don't know what that was, except that in 2 Corinthians, we know that they were suffering uh, under, they, they didn't have much money, and they gave beyond what they were able to. And so they didn't have the opportunity. Maybe they were giving to the uh, Jerusalem church that was in the middle of a famine and, and wasn't able to make ends meet. But we know that the Macedonian church and there in Philippi was, was obviously giving to ministry. They were, not, they were lacking in sympathy, but not opportunity. Um, they, they weren't lacking in, excuse me, reverse that. They were lacking not in sympathy, but in opportunity to give. Maybe they didn't know where Paul was, but they weren't able to give for a season. And now they had a, provided another opportunity, and they don't hold back. They give to the work of Christ in the middle of Rome. There Paul is preaching the gospel, and even though he's in prison, the gospel is going forward, even into the heart of Caesar's family, of, of the palace. So they didn't give out of their abundance. In verse 11, they gave out of their lack. They lacked. They, they were in need. And the word lack is, is the same word. This only occurs one other time. It's the word in Mark 12, 44. If you remember the widow that has two pennies. And she goes and gives, not out of her excess, but out of her lack. She doesn't have anything but two pennies, and she gives it all. And so that's, that's the word that Paul uses there to say that they gave it all. They gave everything that they could. And they were still content. To be content is, is to have this peaceful acceptance of where God has provided and providentially placed him. Paul is not looking elsewhere. He's not saying, maybe I made a mistake in coming to Rome. He is saying he's completely content where he's at. And this word, uh, atarchus, for content, actually is used of a country that has everything it needs and where nothing is imported, it's completely self-sufficient. That's the idea here. Is it's a country that's self-sufficient. But here, Paul's using it different. Because he's not using it like a Stoic saying, I'm completely self-sufficient apart from anything else. He's saying he's content, meaning he's dependent on God. He's not self-sufficient. He's God-sufficient. Only in God is he content. And that's the reality, is that contentment is a rare jewel. Uh, there's... There's two great Puritan works. Jeremiah Burroughs wrote The Rare Jewel of Contentment. is a small book he wrote. Uh, and then also Thomas Watson wrote a book on contentment. But if you notice, there's not many books written on contentment today. Not a lot of people write on contentment. They write on thankfulness and, and gratitude and different aspects. But contentment is a rarity. It's a rare jewel. But we know in 1 Timothy, Paul says godliness with what? Contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we need to be aware that if we are God-sufficient, we'll be looking to Christ and to him and find contentment. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity. He says, the Christian says, creatures were not, uh, were not born 
with desires and less satisfied uh, and less satisfaction for those desires exists. So basically a baby is born hungry and there's food that can fill its belly. A duckling wants to swim and there's a thing called water that it can swim in. So if I find a desire which no experience in this world is, can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly desires satisfy it, this proves not that, uh, this doesn't prove that the universe is a fraud. It proves that all these things are shadows and echoes. And so he, he ends the statement and he says, I must never let it uh, get snowed under or turned aside to think that I'm made for a different country. A true, my true country is not this world, but the next. And he says, we must spend a lifetime to press on to that country that's in Christ and to help others do the same. How are we pressing others to see the country that is the next country? Many times we are focused on this country and what happens here. We need to be, like, like Lewis said, looking to the next country, realizing that these are just shadows of that country, realizing that, yes, what we do here matters. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but what we do here also should point to the one whose kingdom is unshakable. In fact, Calvin says being content in plenty is a rare virtue. So that's rare to find someone who's rich and content. I don't know if I've ever met someone that's rich and content. And that should speak volumes to us to realize that I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying to, to go out and be poor. What I'm saying is that Paul has learned contentment as he followed Christ. He learned what ma mattered most. So he learned it whether he had, was abounding in much or whether he had little. But the point is he was looking to Christ. It's, it's, is Christ enough in any circumstance you face? We must run to him. We must look to Christ who gives us contentment. See, the rich are tempted to deny God. The poor are tempted to want to be like the rich or to steal in order to gain. And the writer of Proverbs says, give me a content life. Give me what I need. Help me see that you are the most important, O oh Lord. Contentment is learned in real and everyday life. It's Proverbs 30 there. So we, we, we see Christ. We know that only Christ can satisfy and so Paul shows a spectrum of need and supply. He says that some, you know, I was in need and I was content. I had plenty and I was content. He learned to be constantly content in Christ each and every day, whether he was brought low or abounded. And so that's why there in, he says, I know how to abound. I know uh, I have learned the secret of abundance and need in verse 12 of chapter 4. And he, he says in verse uh, 9 of chapter 1 that your love may, at what, abound more and more. So he says, rather than your things abounding, you want the love of Christ to abound in your life and your heart, to learn to rely on Christ in all things, to trust Christ no matter what comes our way, that are you strengthened, how are you strengthened, right? This is that verse that everyone has on a coffee mug or a plaque. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But many times people misapply it. They think of, I can, I can go and be an Olympic snowboarder through Christ who strengthens me. Is that what it's saying? Or I can go and lift up a house because Christ strengthens No, the point of this passage, it, it, many times people take it out of context. The point is no matter what happens, whether he's brought low or he's abounding, whether he has much or little, that the secret to being content is to have Christ's strength in him, not his own strength. That Christ in him is his hope. And so he's strengthened because of Christ, what Christ is doing. The scope of all things involves the hardship and prosperity of verse 12. And this verse uh, should not be interpreted as a promise that believers can do anything they desire to do. It is not a promise that God will give every believer the strength to com compete in the Olympics if they so desire. Instead, we see um, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, but for me, my, but as for me, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly 
of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, our weakness invites the power of Christ to be in us. If we pretend to be strong and prideful, we will have no strength. That, that word strengthens actually is the word uh, dynamos that we get the word, what, dynamite, right? So dynamite, dynamos. It, it actually, rather than thinking of explosive, think of powerful strength. So it means to be empowered, to be enabled, to be made strong, to be increased in strength, that you can do all things through the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of your personal difficult circumstances. See, that's the, that's the thing that is hopeful, is that if we know that Christ is a, with, with us, no matter what happens, then it makes all the difference in the world. If we think that we must do it in and of ourselves, we'll always fall short. We need the riches of his glory. We need Christ to fill up our lives with his strength. Are you preoccupied on circumstances or are you looking to the Savior? To quote the NASCAR driver Jeff Gordon, he says, either you focus or you end up hitting something really hard. <laughs> it's, it's a simple but true statement. This illustrates the nature of the Christian life. Either you focus on Jesus or you will crash into discontentment. Complaining, deceit, distrust, or greed. The secret is focusing on Jesus and communing with him daily, finding your strength in him. Alec, uh, Alec Motyer, who's a, he's a guy that wrote a commentary, he says, no circumstance could ever arise which would be too much for Paul's God, and therefore no circumstance could ever beat Paul. If our strength is found in God, we don't have anything to fear. If our strength is found in our circumstance, we have a lot to fear. So Christ brings us good news in that we are thankful, and the thankfulness uh, flows into every situation, bringing the fullness in every partnership. So, so point two, the gospel brings fullness to every partnership. The gospel brings fullness to every partnership. So here, they are kind to share. They have fellowship with Paul. The gospel partnership is a theme that, that Paul highlights over and over again that grace is featured. So, so in verse 7 of chapter 1, he says, For you were all partakers with me of grace. In verse 14 of chapter 4, he says, uh, That you all shared in my trouble. So the, the share, that's the, the, the root word of that is koinonia, where we get, if you think of coin, it's common, those things that we hold in common. And it's the idea of partnership, someone partnering with someone. So the word, root word means to have fellowship or to be made a partnership. To, to fellowship means to share something in common with another person in partnership. And it's the idea to participate with others in a common enterprise. It is by sending financial gifts, the Philippians were actually close partners in gospel ministry with Paul. So we see that in verse 5, Quinonia says partnership in the gospel of chapter 1. In verse 7 of chapter 1, he says partakers of grace. In verse 14 of chapter 4, he says share in my trouble. In 15 of chapter 4, he says enter into partnership. So all those words are getting at the idea that when trouble happens, their partnership's right there. They're sharing in partnership. I think of um, the idea that Paul is saying that trouble there is the idea of a wine press that's pressing in on us. And that he's saying, you're helping me out in the midst of me being hemmed in and pressed in. He feels the weight of where he's at in prison, preaching the gospel. I'm sure it wasn't happy joy joy every time he woke up, but he did have that imminent joy that came from the gospel itself, knowing that Christ was with him and that he was preaching the good news. So every, you know, he, it says that he was with them, they were with him from the very start of preaching the gospel in Macedonia there in 15 and 16. He said they were at the beginning of preaching the gospel in Macedonia. See, the good news is not good advice. I think that's what we sometimes forget. The good news is not good advice. Every other religion in the world has this idea that 
you come, you do these things, and you're accepted, right? But what good news tells us is, th is this picture. So think of victories happen. And when the victory happens, what, what has to happen after the victory is won is that messengers are sent out. And those messengers have to get back to the cities so that the cities know whether to prepare for invasion or to prepare to um, celebrate and to join in the victory that's happened on the battlefield. And so you see that in the, the victory at Marathon. That's where we get 26 miles. The guy runs. He says they've won this, this amazing victory. Uh, the Greeks then celebrate because they were ready to flee. They were, they were getting in ships and ready to go if they lost. And so this idea of victory, of good news, is the idea that Christ has already won the battle. Amen. There isn't a battle for us to win in that sense. Christ has already won the battle. That's not to say give up. It just means you fight harder. When the allies took all the, you know, when, when Hitler ends up killing himself, the allies have, have won. They didn't say, oh, well, it's all over. We're just going to give up and go home. No, they kept on. They kept going until the battle was complete. The battle was won. They just had to finish it. And so he's saying the good news is that Christ has already won it. This isn't good advice. The preaching of the gospel brings about the idea that it's all of grace from start to finish. Amen. All of grace from start to finish. So when we come to the cross, it actually is a scandal. Because those who think they're good look at it and go, wait, they get in? Those people get in? What they don't realize is that we're all in the same boat. No matter, if we went out to, we went out to Letchworth and stood at the edge of that cliff, right, the gorge, even if you were the best jumper in the world, how far would you get? You might get 10, 15, 20 feet out, but you're still dead. And so that's what we have to realize is that our good works are nothing compared to what Christ has done. What do we need to get across that gorge? We either need a helicopter or a big bridge. And Christ has carried us by his perfect life, by his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the good news, Amen. that we don't have to try to jump across the bridge because we can't make it on our own. We need the, we, the gospel says we need a savior. And that savior has come in power and purpose to bring us across safely and to give us relationship with Christ himself. So it tells us that we are worse than we ever thought we were. We're more sinful and deceived than we ever thought we were. But it also tells us that we're more loved and accepted if we have faith in Christ, if we turn to Christ, than we ever believed we could be. And that gives us hopeful confidence to walk through any circumstance like what Paul is saying here. No other church saw it. And here's, here's the idea that the Philippians saw this and they said, we need to partner with the Apostle Paul. That they saw that this increased in their, in their <clears throat> understanding and they wanted others to know the same. That's why we partner with missionaries. We want to see the gospel go forward. We know that Christ has commanded us to what? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So the question is, how are we opening our minds and our hearts and even our pocketbooks to see the gospel go forward like the Philippians did. Paul want, wants not his own interest, but he's seeking their interest. He says, uh, he, he basically is, is telling them that their hearts are in the right place, that God has used what they've done, and they've, they've sacrificed for him. In fact, he kind of alludes to Matthew 6, where he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures that are only found in heaven, that can't be touched by moth or moths or rust or can't be destroyed by thieves or, or stolen. See, your treasure must be found in Christ. Your heart must be completely his. Their gift brought Paul immense joy. And, and here he's saying that he's supplied and he abounds and that he has received the full amount. And, and the idea is that he's accounted it, and he said that this is an amazing accounting that God wants, is personally blessing them because of what they have done. 
if not in this life, the next. He says it's, a, it's an aroma. And it goes back to the Old Testament aroma, uh, like the sacrifice, right? So you put a sacrifice on the altar, you burn it, and God said it was a pleasing aroma if it was done in faith. And that God accepted us and made us at peace because of Christ. So again, we're not getting into heaven because we give, but we give because we have been gotten by Christ. That Christ has grabbed a hold of us, and he's changed us. I remember reading about Sam Houston, who was big in the making Texas. He, he was the last person anyone would have expected to come to Christ. He comes to Christ. He's this, this soldier. He comes to Christ. He gets baptized, and then he starts giving his money away. And people go, what happened? He said, well, my whole life, including my pocketbook, got baptized. And so the whole idea here is that our lives, if we know the Christ, everything changes. Our priorities change. Our purpose changes. Our mission changes. It's no longer about us. It's about Christ. It's about making him known. See, here he says, my God will supply all your needs. All your needs. In his, and, he, and he uses Christ's riches to illustrate that and to say that Christ is rich and able to fulfill all the needs that they have. So they're not to be anxious. Remember back last week in, in verse 6 of chapter 4, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, <clears throat> which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The idea here is that we're not to be anxious about our every day because God holds all of our days in his hands. He holds everything in his hands. Our faith is to be placed in, tr in complete trust to what Christ has done and what he will do. I often think about George Mueller. He didn't ask for one dollar, and yet he built these huge orphanages, and no one could believe that he did it just on prayer. But the reality is that there is power in prayer because that's where God's presence resides, as we seek God, as we trust God in the midst of it. You know, the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet he, for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. God has given to us Christ himself. So we have many fears when it comes to money. But we need to fight that. We need to fight with the promises of God himself. God loves his children. Believe this. He has taken hold of us and we are his. So treasure Jesus. Trust the Father. He's good to his kids. We should go back over and over to scripture and remind ourselves of his promises. We should fix our eyes on the cross in the moment of doubt and anxiety, and remember that God has already solved the greatest problem of our lives. And because he's solved that problem, he can solve any other problem. Amen. You know, Romans 8.32 should, should roll around in your head every day. He who did not spare his own son but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We have a God that has well supplied us with salvation forever. Do you think he's going to leave off the every day? Do you think he's going to let us go and go, oh, well, you're on your own now? No, he's applied the righteousness of Christ for our lives. He saved us from our sins. He's applied Christ's righteousness, his perfect life. And now because of that, we can live with confidence knowing that every day is in his hands and we can trust him. So that's why Paul talks about being filled, well supplied. So verse 11 in chapter 1, he says, he's filled the fruit of righteousness to the glory and praise of God. And then uh, in chapter 4 and verse 18, he says, I'm well supplied. Uh, in chapter seven, 4, verse 17, he says, I seek the fruit that increases to your account. And then to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever in chapter 4, verse 20. See, on the day that Christ comes, he is going to be glorious, and we will understand that everything was worth it. Our downs and ups, everything. That we are to live for that day, when every knee will bow. 
So the gospel brings us full thank, thanksgiving to every situation and partnership, but it also gives us glad greeting. So the, the last point here is the gospel brings greeting to every saint in Christ. Greetings to every saint in Christ. So what does that look like? Um, Paul, the, the idea of greeting is this embrace, this joyful embrace, that Christ joyfully embraces us. We are to embrace others. The idea of saint is that of holiness or uh, object of awe, clean, um, one who is set apart by God. And that's what saints are. We are set apart by God because of Christ. Our life is tied to Jesus because of the gospel. He is the one who's raised from the dead, and he raises us from our deadness, right? From our sins and trespasses, he has saved us. He's given new life to us. That should marvel. That should give us awe as we wake up each day, as we walk through the day. We should embrace Christ and embrace others because of Christ. The kingdom of God is poured out, and it's better than the kingdoms of this world. So Rome doesn't have a candle on the kingdom to come. Even though they were one of the greatest kingdoms ever, we have a better king. The U.S., I don't know how long we have as a, as a nation, as a, as a what we call kingdom, uh, but we do know that we have a kingdom to come that's better. See, Paul highlights this group to remind the, the Philippians that the gospel of Christ has conquered even the household of Caesar. He says, Caesar's household greets you. The gospel continues to spread according to God's wise and powerful purposes, which includes Paul's imprisonment in Rome. If you think about it, the Old Testament always has, in Sunday school, we talk about how people would die. And when they would die, they would repeat, oh, Moses died at the end of Deuteronomy, and then they would repeat it in Joshua 1 to make sure, yeah, he's, he's dead, so now Joshua is taking over. But in the, in the New Testament, what do you have? You have a record of resurrection. The first four books, Christ dies and rises again. And you see that the, at the end of Acts, you would assume that, okay, it's going to end with Paul's death because he's marching to Rome, but instead it ends with the gospel going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality, is the kingdom is not, it's not able to be killed because Christ is the king, and he is resurrected, and we will be resurrected one day. So grace is God's, this is the understanding that we as a church look to our king, not to our circumstances. Look to the savior, not to ourselves. And this is the marvelous joy of Christ's exalting letter that now ends as it began, with an emphasis upon the grace of God being even more fully bestowed upon his people because of the spirit from the new birth to the new heavens in the new earth, the Christian life is entirely one of grace from start to finish. It is all grace, so we can rejoice. So as we see the gospel greets every saint, has won the day in the cross and the empty grave greets us our, this very day. We need to learn to be content. We need to learn to see things through the eyes of faith, realizing that God's ability to supply our every needs. We need to keep looking to Christ no matter the circumstance. So, because Christ has, has met our deepest needs in himself, no matter what we walk through, his strength is available to his children, to those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, that we can go and walk through the grace and through faith and by his grace and faith alone in himself, we know that only Christ brings true contentment and joy. In closing, let, as we prepare to go before the communion table here, let me, let me just read one of my favorite <clears throat> modern hymns. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my strength, my light, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are stilled when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand.
Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful. <clears throat> we are thankful that you alone are the Savior and King, that you save your people, that we can have confidence in tomorrow because you already hold all our days in your hand. And I pray that you would just be with us as we come before the communion table. We would see Christ more clearly. And we would leave with a sense of what you've done, of how good you are, and how much you've paid on, on behalf of us. Lord, you are the Savior. You're the King. And we look, we look with complete trust to you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen.